Good afternoon, South County community. My name is Dick Perry. I'm the superintendent of the schools. And today, Tuesday, July 20th, we are presenting our middle school reopening plan. This is our series of three live stream events to our families in the community to discuss the reopening plan for South County for the fall of 2020. Uh, to my immediately, immediate right, your left of the camera screen is our assistant superintendent for instruction, Mr. Timothy Backus. Uh, immediately to my right is our assistant superintendent for human resources, Mr. Christopher Robolati. Uh, also joining us today is our middle school principals. Uh, immediately to uh, second from my left is Mr. David Wetzel, principal at Lysheville Middle School, and Mr. Mike Marone, our principal at Sand Creek Middle School. So we appreciate uh, both principals being here today to discuss our reopening plan and give uh, middle school parents a little overview of what it will look like for their children come the fall. Uh, this reopening plan has been uh, in conjunction with our South County uh, Reopening Task Force, which is a membership of approximately 50 people, including Board of Education members, district office administrators, uh, building principals at both elementary, middle, and high school levels, uh, community uh, personnel, including parents and family members, uh, community personnel, including the county police, fire, and EMS, as well as our uh, O&M staff, our transportation staff, IT staff, food service members, our district medical director and nursing staff, as well as uh, a variety of folks from our uh, physical education and uh, health departments. So we appreciate uh, everyone's uh, patience as we develop this plan. Again, uh, this is still a draft. We will be submitting our formalized plan by the end of the week, um, then waiting uh, for the governor to announce the reopening uh, process in New York State sometime between August 1st and August 7th. Um, all of these plans are draft plans at this time and subject to the overall uh, governor's executive order to reopen schools. Our plan today outlines a series of four guiding principles. Uh, the first and foremost guiding principle is to develop a plan to help promote the safety and well-being of all of our students, faculty, staff, and community members. That's our priority number one. Our second priority is to develop a plan that enhances and promotes the educational opportunities for all of our students in the district, whether they be in person or in a hybrid or 100% remote model. Um, our third priority is to continue to look at student-centered activities and how they relate to our overall ability to reopen schools safely and what impact clubs and activities co-curriculars may uh, have in COVID-19. And finally, uh, our goal as a community is to contribute to the overall uh, reduction in the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And we will talk about the safety protocols and what we will do to help our students and, and staff uh, not only reopen school in a safe manner, but continue to adhere to the guidelines um, administered by not only the Department of Health, but the Center for Disease Controls. Uh, this plan has been uh, formulated in conjunction with South County Reopening Task Force with the Capital Region BOCES uh, Regional Committee um, in conjunction with uh, guidance from the Governor's Office from the New York State Education Department, uh, as well as guidance documents from the Department of Health and the Center for Disease Control. We've looked at a variety of resources and materials, uh, interim guidance that has come out from New York State and Office of Facilities, and uh, formulated this draft plan today, and our goal is to give you an overview of what it will look like in the middle school levels in the fall. Uh, we have uh, attempted to reach out to our community members through a series of surveys. We had over uh, 200 individual responses with about 1,800 um, questions that were submitted. Our goal is to try to address some of those questions today and continue to use our website to build out the reopening plan and a frequently asked questions page to help our uh, families uh, better understand what it will look like in the fall. Uh, overall, our uh, guidance has been uh, attributed to uh, some of the interim guidance that we received from uh, the governor's office. Uh, you may have seen plans for reopening throughout uh, multiple states. We have uh, looked at plans from not only New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, in Connecticut regionally, but also uh, plans for uh, schools throughout the United States, including uh, Maryland and, uh, and California. Uh, we believe we can learn from our Southern and Western uh, counterparts who are starting schools approximately a month earlier and continue to look at how uh, we can do a better job in educating our students in whatever manner we are in. Um, first thing I wanna talk about is a little bit about the academic calendar. We had approved the academic calendar in the spring of 2020 to include a reopening just after Labor Day. Uh, we do anticipate uh, if we receive guidance from the governor that we can reopen 
we will reopen sometime in uh, early September. But keep in mind that due to uh, future executive orders or future uh, COVID-19 uh, closures, we may reserve the right to modify the calendar to uh, not only provide for flexibility in our um, delivery of the instructional program, but also in our flexibility for staff training needs that may occur. The goal of the plan is to develop an in-person plan for students. Uh, we also look at a plan at the 712 level for a hybrid model um, and the ability to move from one platform to the next, either 100% in person or 100% remote should the subject be required. Uh, just a few moments, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Backus, who's gonna talk a little bit about our continuity for learning plan, give you an overview of what the district's plans will look like between uh, pre-K through the 12th grade level. Practice. Yes, so from kindergarten to fourth grade, we are looking at the students being in pods, and we are looking at them being in every day. So we need to get down to uh, social distance within the classrooms. So we are looking at using our instructional spaces within the elementary buildings uh, to get the students spread out between the classrooms and to get down to a number in which they can be socially distanced within those classrooms. Uh, at the five, six level, same. We will be getting the students in every day uh, also spreading them out into what we would call pods so that they are socially distanced within those, uh, but once again, in every day. Our students at the 7th through 12th grade level, we are looking at them being in on-site, on campus, two out of a, in a six-day rotation. The other four days, they will be on a remote um, instruction, which means this will be a hybrid uh, schedule in which they will be in the school a couple of days and then four days remote. Uh, so from that standpoint, we are working towards having the elementary, the K-6 students in every single day and having the 7-12 students in 2 out of 6 and uh, in a hybrid schedule with remote being four days of that. We, we have expectations that the students will be in mass. Uh, we will work with teachers on the appropriateness of the age group, uh, the developmental nature of the students in wearing the mask. Uh, particularly when they can't be social distance and then in transitions, buses, moving in hallways, uh, anytime that they're moving about their seats. Uh, but we're hoping that if they are socially distanced within the classrooms, that they may have masks on, they may not, depending on uh, what's going on in the classroom. And also from the standpoint, too, that um, they will have mask breaks during the course of the day, so it will not be an expectation that they'll be in um, the masks all day, all every day, all day. But it will be certainly that they will be uh, asked to wear them at the appropriate times and for the majority of the day, to be honest with you. So the other couple things to keep in mind is that um, we'll be setting up the buildings a little bit differently. And Dr. Perry and the uh, principals will get into some of this later. Uh, but you know, recess will look a little different. Uh, lunches will look a little different. You will see markings in the classrooms and markings in the hallways, similar to what you see in the supermarkets right now. Uh, but only passing in certain directions, uh, only using certain stairwells to go up and certain stairwells to go down. Uh, other things we're taking into consideration too from the standpoint of continuity of learning it would be the grading. Right now the plan is to have everybody on site K-6 and because of that we would be following our usual grading procedures and policies that we have in place already. Uh, at the 712 level we will be following mainly what we have in place for grading, but we'll be taking a look at some of that to take into account what the hybrid model will look like. Will look like. If we end up going completely remote, uh, we will revisit all those grading policies. Because of the fact that we learned a lot from March 13th on and we took into account things related to equity, uh, we will have different policies in place if we are completely remote. But in summary, K-6, uh, on-site every day in pods, 7-12, two out of six days, four days remote. Very good, and I know uh, Mr. Max, you may have touched upon this, uh, but uh, special education students. Them, sorry, yeah, special education students, our self-contained students will be in every day. Um, and we are prioritizing those that uh, are in one room for most of the day uh, to be on site uh, so we can have you know, their educational program be on site. Uh, after that, we will have um, any students that aren't in self-contained will follow the other schedules, particularly the two out of six. Thank you very much. Thank so self-contained students uh, will be prioritized to being on site. We'll be delivering uh, supplemental services such as speech and E&L uh, to, to our students as well, whether they're in person or in a remote environment. Um, throughout the course of the opening of the school year, as we do each year, we'll provide some 
transition time for our students and work with them uh, on orientation skills as to the protocols. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that may look like in the middle school with our middle school principals in just a few moments. Um, we will continue to try to notify our families uh, as soon as possible once we understand what the governor's uh, timeline is for reopening. And we will give uh, options for uh, presenting a survey out to the public uh, sometime between August 10th and August 20th for those families who may opt out of uh, in-person instruction as well as uh, information related to transportation services. We'd like to know if families are going to use our school transportation or if they will be driving their children themselves. So we will be uh, formulating that survey once we know uh, whether or not the governor gives the green light to reopen schools and in what capacity. And then between August 10th and August 20th, we will be surveying our families, asking them to commit to either the uh, in-person model or if they choose to uh, look at uh, other uh, remote options, we will uh, message that out in the early part of August. Um, as uh, Mr. Beck had uh, touched upon, uh, we will continue to work with our students uh, in a variety of educational manners, so looking at the grading facilities. Uh, we do anticipate a, a traditional nine period day as uh, our students had become accustomed to when we were in person in the past. And uh, the expectations will that students, whether they're in person or in a remote hybrid model, will have a prescribed schedule. And I'll ask the principal to talk a little bit more about that uh, coming forward. Um, student activities and events, athletics um, for the fall, currently through uh, guidance by the New York State Public High School Athletic Association, all athletics are on pause until at the earliest September 21st. That means there are no uh, organized uh, team activities, no organized individual activities uh, during the month of August, as we have traditionally come to know for fall sports. Um, students and uh, facilities uh, are on pause until September 21st. This means that our school uh, buildings and our athletic facilities, both outdoors and indoors, are closed to the public. This includes our tennis courts, our tracks, basketball courts, both indoors and outdoors. But we understand that this is an inconvenience and certainly one that uh, with nice weather out, uh, people would like to come and use our facilities, but due to an abundance of caution and because of the fact that schools are on restriction in the phase four reopening, our school facilities are still closed. Um, for the fall, we are going to look at what activities that we may be able to adhere to uh, in a socially distance appropriate environment. That may mean that concerts are either done without um, community uh, audience in, in person. It may be a live stream or a remote uh, concert, a virtual option. Um, Co-curricular clubs and activities may continue uh, within the building, but we will also look at how we can deliver some of those activities in a remote option for those students that will be in a hybrid model at the 7-8 level. We'll talk a little bit more about what that could look like. Um, again, uh, a lot to identify the things that are important to students, those activities, those athletics, uh, that help to supplement our educational experience currently are on pause. We are looking at all options for our students to be able to deliver as much of those activities as possible under the current guidance. Uh, but for athletics for the fall, that is on pause until at the earliest September 21st for a startup. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Rubilati. He's going to talk a little bit about employee safety and some of the training protocols we've put into place for our employees to make sure that they're protected. Sure. Um, First and foremost, um, a big part of the guidance that came from uh, State Ed and the Department of Health refers to training, trainings that include um, focusing on staff, faculty, and students. Uh, this will be done in a blended manner. We'll, we're, we'll do some trainings in person when we have uh, staff in the buildings. We'll do some trainings when staff are with students. And we'll also push them out in a blended fashion where we do some electronic um, videos posted to our website when we build out that page. Uh, to help parents understand what things may look like, uh, what they would expect their children's experience to be like inside our buildings at all the different levels. Uh, this year, uh, we did have some trainings for our staff that are um, focused on COVID-related issues, such as anxiety and depression. Uh, and also, we have special trainings for our um, O&M and custodians on cleaning, the different devices that we have, and the different um, chemicals that we're using to clean and disinfect. Uh, there's an entire plan built out uh, by the O&M department that will help ensure that we're sanitizing appropriately. 
uh, at a regular, regularly scheduled times, uh, multiple times throughout the day. Uh, there is a high level of accountability in all of this for, for the school uh, to maintain our responsibility to keep our children in our classrooms safe learning environments and also an accountability that parents will be speaking with their students with their children about how they feel our staff will be answering questions uh, four questions a day and a self-screening model and we would ask and we'll push these questions out to our families that you ask those same questions of your children uh, each morning to make sure that they um, are feeling well and they don't hit any of the markers that would cause them to stay home we would ask that any student or staff that are feeling symptoms that are um, new to them and they're not feeling 100% uh, healthy, that they would stay home, um, that you would exercise uh, caution in those cases and, and not run the risk of um, bringing those uh, germs and viruses into the school. So we're asking for a partnership between the school and our parents and a unified approach to making uh, the experience this, this fall a safe and healthy one. And that would be the only way we'll be able to continue with uh, in-person instruction is if we're following the protocols and really adhering to our expectations uh, at, in the buildings, uh, students, staff, and families. So. Thank you. And I think it's uh, important, Mr. Rubalati had mentioned, uh, not only will the staff be doing a, a daily screening, uh, self-assessment, uh, te temperature checks at home, and an electronic submission, but uh, families will be asked the same series of questions. They will be uh, self-monitoring this uh, asking uh, the same questions at home of their children, whether or not they have a fever of greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, check their temperature at home. Uh, they should uh, ascertain whether or not uh, they are showing any signs or symptoms uh, similar to COVID-19. And we will share out those uh, questions on our website and ask that parents uh, put them on the refrigerator, post them in a common area so that it becomes a daily routine. It's everyone's responsibility to help to enforce this. Um, not only is it a school district's responsibility, but there is an onus on our parents and community members to consistently help to protect the community by doing our own individual um, share. So we appreciate everyone's uh, cooperation in that. We will again uh, share more information out related to those questions, very similar to you uh, maybe going to a vendor in the community uh, who asks a series of questions, maybe checking your temperature and asking you to attest that you have not traveled outside the region or to one of the uh, area hotspots uh, throughout the United States. Uh, the next section is community uh, safety and building access. So uh, in order to ensure the safety of our uh, individual students and buildings, uh, we are limiting the uh, community access to our buildings. Uh, community members will not be using the buildings in the evening time for community education. They will not be utilizing the uh, athletic facilities for uh, basketball or fall athletics programs. Uh, so we do understand that's a, a restriction that uh, it will not be uh, taken lightly, but it is in the best interest of all of our students so that we can maximize the clean and disinfectant uh, to make sure that we can open school each day on a, on a regular basis. So uh, we will continue to look at a broad range of risk mitigation factors uh, to allow us to potentially reopen some of these facilities uh, throughout the course of the school year and try to address uh, the needs of the community based upon a regional approach uh, to the infection rates that, that are coming out. Uh, so we, we do understand that uh, this is a restriction. We would understand that uh, if parents need to come to the building, that they have a, an appointment and that they would adhere to the protocols in each building, um, that they would uh, go through a series of screening questions as well and, and wear a mask uh, in the building while they're there. Um, again, it's our uh, efforts to be not only compliant with the state's requirements in terms of mask wearing, but also to make sure that we are protecting the health and safety of all um, members of our community. Uh, so transportation, uh, what does transportation look like in the fall? So students uh, in transportation, we are looking at a 50% reduction in student capacity on the buses. We have 66 passenger buses. Those will be reduced to um, a half of that capacity. So we're looking at between 20 and 30 students on a bus. Uh, we would encourage parents when possible to drive their children to the school. And we will be uh, using the survey uh, around August 10th to ask parents whether or not they are going to use our transportation um, provided or they uh, choose to drive their children to school. Um, we understand that by having more um, parents drive their uh, children to school, that could potentially result in, in uh, traffic backup and congestion. 
We will work with our individual building principals and talk a little bit about that today as to what that may look like in the middle school. So uh, we will message that information out uh, building by building and recognize that curbside pickup and drop off will most likely be the norm uh, come this fall in uh, all of our buildings. A uh, food service uh, will be available for both breakfast and lunch for students, whether they're in person or in a uh, hybrid or remote environment. So if students are 100% remote, we will still provide food service opportunities for both breakfast and lunch for students, similar to what we are doing now throughout the summertime. Uh, we ask that uh, parents consider uh, whether or not the, their child uh, needs a lunch and we'll communicate that to the food service department. If they're in person, uh, they will go through the cafeteria and it will be a grab and go style menu uh, with prepackaged foods or uh, pre-boxed foods. It will not be a traditional buffet style um, selection. Uh, but we will have a, a rotating menu that provides for not only a nutritious meal uh, for both breakfast and lunch, but also a, a safe uh, way to package that so it's touchless in uh, many of those aspects. Um, our overall plan also includes financial planning. Uh, we appreciate everything that the community has done to support our budget throughout the uh, spring of 2020 and uh, moving forward to the 2021 school year. Uh, so we thank you for your investment in your children's education and in our community schools. Uh, we do recognize that the governor has indicated that there's potential for additional state aid reductions in uh, all schools in New York State. In South County, that could be up to 20% of additional state aid. That would amount to about $3.2 million in additional um, reductions. So uh, should we be faced with that, we are putting together a financial plan to address that. In the interim time period, we are doing everything we can to be fiscally responsible. Uh, to our community members and to be looking at the costs related to uh, reopening schools. There is obviously increased costs related to cleaning, uh, the COVID-19 PPE, uh, personal protective equipment products, as well as providing masks for all students and staff members. So we are looking at ways to balance those, uh, those cost savings and be as efficient as possible. But we will provide the appropriate um, hand sanitizers, cleaning products, uh, soap and uh, disinfectant, as well as masks for students and staff on a regular basis. If you have your own, uh, we encourage you to bring your own face mask in, but uh, we will provide that for everyone who is in need. Uh, just to give you an overview of our communications timeline to date, uh, the governor had come out on uh, July 13th with an order that required schools to develop a reopening plan. We've been working on a reopening plan since March with our reopening task force. As I mentioned, that ad hoc committee has approximately 50 members on it. Um, and we've been uh, not only working locally, but also regionally with capital region BOCES. Uh, many of the members of our committee are also on regional as well as state level committees for reopening, including our own uh, uh, Mrs. Stephanie Conklin, a high school mathematics teacher, was on the governor's reopening task force. Uh, so we're very uh, appreciative of her efforts and time to help advocate for our students to ensure uh, safe protocols and that our um, collective voices are heard so that we can develop a, a plan that's uh, sustainable throughout our, our uh, reopening. So uh, after that announcement, uh, the reopening task force has looked at the guidelines provided by um, New York State. They've included uh, everything from uh, P12 uh, guidance summary from the New York State Education Department, uh, guidelines from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, interim guidance for uh, providing public transportation during COVID-19, uh, New York State contract tracing guidance, uh, interim guidance on private and public employees returning to the workplace. We've looked at interim guidance for uh, sports and recreation in New York State uh, during the pandemic. We looked at the CDC vulnerable um, uh, guidelines, as well as uh, that relates to not only employees, but students and the vulnerable population of, of those uh, individuals who may be more susceptible to the uh, coronavirus. Uh, we've looked at interim guidance for food services in New York State. We've also looked at uh, guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as uh, regional plans from uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts for reopening of schools, as well as uh, schools throughout the United States, including Maryland, uh, California, and Missouri. So we believe we can learn from uh, many of these plans, we've uh, continued to look at guidance uh, from our southern schools to identify what they're doing. They're reopening approximately a month prior to the New York State schools. And so we'll continue to look at those plans and how it may tie into 
what we can do in South County to safely provide for instruction. Uh, we've held a series of uh, uh, not only the reopening task force meetings, approximately six at this time, uh, but we've also uh, surveyed our, our staff, we've surveyed our community members, we appreciate the responses. We've had uh, well over 200 individual uh, survey responses and about 18 individual questions. Our goal is to try to respond to some of those today and continue to build out our website uh, to identify those frequently asked questions for both uh, community members, parents, students, and our staff members. Uh, this is our third of uh, three live streams focusing today on the middle school level. Um, we appreciate everyone's uh, interest and uh, your time to take to watch uh, this presentation today. Our overall task force will meet again on July 30th. Uh, plan is to submit uh, to New York State Education Department on July 31st. Uh, from there, we will await guidance from the governor's office sometime between August 1st and the 7th as to whether or not schools can reopen in person in a hybrid manner or 100% remote. We do anticipate uh, the governor coming down with uh, his executive order sometime between August 1st and the 7th. From there, South County will survey our families again, seeking input as to uh, their comfort level and the willingness to return to students into the level, um, either in person at the K-6 level or the hybrid model at the 7-12 level. Should families be looking for a remote option, we will uh, work as best we can to provide what that remote option would look like and understanding once they commit to a remote option, or an in-person option, they will be doing that for the length of a full semester. Uh, this will help to alleviate uh, the comings and goings uh, between classes to solidify the pods to protect all students and to provide for a consistent continuity of learning. Uh, we anticipate that survey going out um, August 10th through the 20th. Uh, it'll also include a um, request for transportation, whether or not a family is going to need transportation uh, for their children or if they anticipate um, driving their children into the school. So a lot to do. Uh, we've continued to work uh, feverishly each and every day. Uh, this is a draft plan as of July 28th and uh, we will uh, continue to uh, develop that not only during the submission time period but we'll fine tune it throughout the month of August as we look to reopen uh, safely in the fall. So with that I'd like to turn it over uh, to our uh, middle school principals, I'm going to uh, ask a series of questions that have been submitted and ask them to kind of respond uh, as to what it will look like in the middle school level. So one of the uh, top questions uh, that has come up consistently is what will a typical classroom look like in the middle school? So Mr. Wetzel, if you could start out, talk specifically about the 5-6 classroom and then elaborate on what a 7-8 classroom will look like in the fall. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Uh, I actually met with a group of teachers today and we talked a little bit about what it will be like when students return to school. Uh, they're anxious to see their students in the fall and they do want to make sure they do that safely. So one of the first and foremost uh, parts of the plan at 5-6 will be to bring students back every day, but to be able to spread them out into multiple classrooms with the teachers rotating between those classrooms. We believe that if we, uh, if we schedule students into pods of probably 15 to 18 students and they remain with those students all day, that will be the best way for us to maintain some uh, safety among students. Uh, their art teachers would come in to see them, their tech teachers, uh, STEM teachers, PE teachers would filter into those classrooms and that group of students would remain together throughout the day. Uh, they would eat lunch together, have recess together, so on and so forth. Um, students would wear uh, masks at all times in the hallways when they're moving between areas. Uh, if students can't maintain social distance, they would have to have masks on. Otherwise, if they're at their workstations in their classroom, they could have the masks off. It's a little bit different at grade seven, eight. At grade seven, eight, students will be following a rotating schedule. Here in South Colony, we run a six day schedule, uh, K-12, and that will be maintained. We do that because we have shared staff between buildings. Um, so if a, a seventh or an eighth grader would be perhaps meeting on days one and four, 
on days two and five or days three and six, and that schedule would be maintained. They would follow their six period, uh, their six day rotation and their nine period day. Uh, on the days they are not physically in the building, they would be joining their classes remotely, or some teachers may have tasks for them to perform over the days that they're not actually in front of their teacher in the building. Thank you very much. And at Sand Creek, uh, we're looking at a very similar model. We've had conversations uh, similar to the ones that have taken place at Lysha Kill. Uh, what we're looking at uh, at Sand Creek, our five, six students are generally on the second floor. Uh, we'll continue with that. They will be spread out um, across the second floor, but we'll be able to maintain all of our fifth and sixth grade students uh, in the upstairs level, which is uh, where they typically would be. As Mr. Wetzel said, uh, we're looking at um, taking classrooms and making them pods of 15 to 18. Uh, so uh, we're looking at about eight additional uh, classrooms that will be utilized at Sand Creek in the 5-6 uh, level. Um, at 7-8, uh, our students will follow their typical nine period day. Uh, they will uh, be able to practice social distancing within the classroom and we'll also ask them to wear masks as they travel. Uh, we'll have our hallways set up uh, in fashion similar to a grocery store with one-way travel uh, and also some staggered uh, dismissal and arrival uh, to maintain that social distancing as students enter and exit the building. Thank you very much. Uh, so the uh, next question would come up is how do we ensure that uh, students and staff are trained in these protocols? So talk a little bit about uh, student training. What will we do to orientate our students to the safety protocols in place? We understand that our students haven't been in school for several months now, and our fifth graders are just coming into life to kill. So among other things, uh, we know that our students will need some transition directions, um, some directions on coming back to school and being students in a classroom once again. Uh, as we start to acclimate students to uh, the middle school in general, we also know that we'll need to do some safety education, ways to keep students safe, some reminders about hand washing and proper sanitation. Uh, those will all be parts of the educational program when students return to school. And just piggybacking off of that, what I would say is that um, each September at both middle schools, when students arrive, we spend a great deal of time laying foundation for uh, all of the uh, in-person transitions, uh, things like going to lunch, traveling in the hallways, entering it and exiting the buildings. I think we're just reimagining what September will look like on top of all of the typical foundational uh, pieces that teachers will be working with students on. We're, we'll, we'll now be adding in the uh, safety protocols uh, and we'll be able to do that in a couple different formats. There'll be the opportunity for teachers to do that in person when the students are there. And we'll also have opportunities uh, for families to view those remotely. So we're looking at a hybrid model of training for the, both the students and the staff. So our families will have access to the training materials or the videos that we put out for our students uh, so they can reinforce some of those protocols at home as well. So appreciate that. Uh, the next question was related to uh, access to uh, Chromebooks during remote instruction. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what families would do in terms of uh, access to Chromebooks and will students at the 5-8 level have their own Chromebooks to work on? It will be vital, it, it will be absolutely necessary for our seventh and eighth graders to have access to Chromebooks at home uh, because they are doing that rotation of both remote learning and in-school learning. So I can see a, a plan in which uh, students have their Chromebooks and they will need to access those on a daily basis. For fifth and sixth graders, they'll have to have access to their Chromebooks at school to work on assignments and perhaps at home as well. Um, you know, one of the things is connectivity and, and the other issues that come up are simply IT issues. Uh, students sometimes have trouble with their Chromebooks, have trouble accessing technology at school. We have a help desk to work through issues and we have a pretty good uh, way of, of taking care of those things at school. Uh, a phone call in, an email in can usually troubleshoot the problem. Mr. Warren, anything you want to no, address on that? Just so at the five, six level, students may be using their Chromebook in the school classroom, but they may also be taking that Chromebook home, depending upon what's going on. But we expect that they're in person every day, therefore they'd be using that uh, device. Um, what kind of protocols would we be putting in place to uh, clean and disinfect some of the products that um, may come in 
to contact like a keyboard and things like that. So I think uh, one of the key pieces there is uh, you go back to the training piece. I think uh, a lot of it will go to making sure that uh, our students and staff understand the need to wipe those uh, materials down. Uh, I know that our uh, custodial staff will be working uh, readily to, to disinfect all areas that students have been in. But I think the training piece of that is to make sure that uh, both our students and our teachers understand that you know, when we have devices that are going to be shared, if there are shared devices, there will be some protocols put in place to make sure they're dis disinfected properly. And we will have hand sanitizers available for students in, in all areas, all classrooms. Uh, in addition, uh, our five, six classrooms have uh, sinks with access to soap and water and, and cleaning products. So within that classroom space, they'll have access to be able to uh, clean and disinfect their own personal location. But obviously, we'll have uh, frequent cleaning of our high uh, High touch points, uh, such as lockers and, and uh, cubbies and, and uh, you know, desktops. And I, I would just say, ideally, uh, at the five six level, we're, we're going to be able to allocate the Chromebooks in such a way that students within the classroom will have their own dedicated device. Uh, so the need to have a shared device should be very limited. Okay. Thank you. So one of the questions that came up was uh, related to positive uh, test cases. Uh, so if somebody uh, tests positive, whether it be a student or staff member, what will be the responsibility to notify families and, and what will happen in terms of quarantine or shutting the classroom down? So a lot of that has to do with the metrics of the region. Uh, in the event of a positive uh, report of a case, COVID-19, of either a student or staff member, um, our individual um, school nurses will contact the Albany County Department of Health. The Albany County Department of Health will use their contract tracing protocols in place to notify uh, potential people that they've come in contact with. So the school's responsibility will be to provide a list, a class list, uh, phone numbers for students, phone numbers for staff members, uh, potential uh, contacts that that individual has come in contact with. This will all be done in a uh, protective confidential manner. We would not be releasing the name of an individual student or staff member to the public, but we would indicate that a positive uh, case had been uh, confirmed in fifth grade or sixth grade in a particular classroom. That would not require the entire school building to shut down. Um, it may require students to quarantine or may require staff members to quarantine based upon the Department of Health protocols in place. Um, so the contract tracers from Albany County will contact those individual families and make them aware of that protocol. We will clean and disinfect to so shut down that particular classroom for the period of time that it requires us to clean and disinfect the room in its entirety. That may be an hour or two hours at a particular time. Remove students from that environment to make sure we do a thorough uh, cleaning and disinfecting. Um, in the event that uh, uh, we have uh, multiple cases, again, we will follow the same protocols. The Albany County Department of Health will work with uh, individual school buildings to identify what the metrics are for a uh, shutdown of a classroom where they will go 100% remote, uh, self-quarantine if necessary, as well as a school building. We do understand that uh, there's a potential for uh, cross-contamination between siblings. Maybe you have a sibling at the elementary level and another sibling at the middle school level. So our school buildings will be in communication uh, with each other and the Department of Health. So our school nurses and our nurse coordinator, along with our medical director, will help to formulate those protocols in alignment with uh, guidance from the Center for Disease Control, as well as uh, local contact with our Albany County Department of Health. Uh, some other questions were related to um, social distancing on, on a bus. How do you uh, enforce um, social distancing on a bus? Um, uh, that is going to require mask wearing at all times. Uh, when a child leaves their house, they should have already done the self screen questions with their parents. Their temperature should be checked. You're testing the fact that they're healthy enough to report to the bus stop and attend school. Um, in the event that the uh, student boards the bus, they'll get on with a mask. Uh, once they uh, come into this school uh, parking lot, uh, that's where I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Marone and Mr. Wetzel to talk a little bit about what will it look like if I'm on a bus or if I'm driving my child to school so it's not just a free-for-all um, at the drop-off. So either one of you gentlemen want to talk a little about the protocols for uh, pickup and drop-off. Sure. Um, there will be some similarities, I believe, at, at both Lysha Kill and Sand Creek. However, uh, buildings are different in their structure. But what I believe is we are going to have to um, devise a plan that uh, spaces out um, 
the drop off and pick up because we won't be able to accommodate all cars at the same time. Anyone who knows life should kill well knows there's already a traffic issue in the morning. If we're adding more vehicles to, uh, to the entry of school in the morning, it just won't be feasible. So we will have to space out vehicles uh, to some extent. We may have to look at where we're bringing vehicles in, where we're bringing buses in. Um, but we are in the midst of talking about those things. We want to be sure that we get students in in a, in a safe manner, in an orderly manner. And part of it is getting everyone's day started off in a calm manner um, so that we can get to learning and, um, and avoid the problems in the morning. I think uh, along with that, we'd be looking at uh, building in a little bit of time on the front and back ends of the day. Uh, right now we have a 10 minute homeroom. We may, looking at, uh, we may be looking at extending that a bit just to allow for that staggered arrival uh, as students arrive, being able to enter the building off of a bus, uh, you know, one bus at a time perhaps. Uh, also uh, curbside drop off for parents where students are entering uh, and, and exiting the building one at a time. And, and uh, Mr. Wetzel and I are both looking at uh, building a little bit of time on the front and back of the school day uh, just to accommodate for a little bit longer uh, arrival and dismissal. Uh, those specifics will be messaged out uh, by both of us uh, once uh, we, we move into August, but um, we are being cognizant of the fact that, that process might take a little bit longer. Uh, so we're gonna build some extra time uh, to accommodate for that. Okay, so uh, some of the questions that came up were, uh, you know, will there be a uniform platform for instructional delivery in each school building and will there be set times for classes daily? So in terms of the platform, uh, our teachers have worked throughout the springtime on Google Classroom and training the Google Meets. That will be the expectation that we will be providing um, access to Google Classroom to our students at the 7-8 level and certainly the 9-12 level. Um, talk a little bit more about set class times. Are we going to run the ninth period day? Yeah. For example, if my child is in seventh grade at Life Kill Middle School and they have science eighth period in the afternoon, uh, that's when that class will be held each day. Uh, whether the student is physically in the school building or that student is on remote learning that day. Uh, again, the way that looks may be different depending on the day, depending on the teacher. That student taking science during that period may be joining the classroom uh, through Google Meet, or perhaps that student will be working on an assignment or a project for the teacher. But we do believe it's important to maintain a, a schedule, our nine period schedule, and keep students on that routine, uh, whether they're in school or they're on remote learning. Yeah, um, our 5-6 is also looking at maintaining a uh, typical schedule. Uh, they'll have a little bit more flexibility at 5-6 because they're gonna be on site uh, daily and uh, we'll be looking at uh, ELA and math as, as being prioritized with uh, science and social studies also being folded into uh, their typical instructional day. As Mr. Wetzel mentioned earlier, uh, not only will they have those uh, experiences, but they'll have the opportunity within that nine periods framework to meet with their uh, physical education, technology, and uh, other special area classes. So uh, we certainly are looking at running a day that will look very similar to uh, a day that we were running last September. And that'll provide us the flexibility to go from remote instruction to an in-person instruction in a lot of ways. Um, throughout the, the day, obviously, kids are going to get uh, hungry. What, what does the uh, lunchtime look like? Kids are hungry throughout the day. Um, what, what I envision is that at least at the start of the school year, our fifth and sixth graders will be eating meals in their classrooms in those pods. Um, our seventh and eighth graders, because we only have a third of uh, our seventh and eighth grade at a time, we can provide social distancing in our cafeterias. So I see our students going into our cafeterias. Um, our lunches and breakfasts will probably be a grab and go, a box variety. Uh, we'll work out those plans. Um, but that's what I see. Yeah, and similar at Sand Creek, I think uh, Mr. West touched on the fact that with our seventh and eighth graders, we are able to socially distance that number of students within the cafeterias. Uh, with our five and six uh, both being on site daily, uh, 
we currently wouldn't be able to uh, socially distance within the cafeteria. So starting them eating in their classroom pods uh, will be the plan. Um, certainly understanding that uh, teachers and um, some of their special area folks will be looking for opportunities to, to leave those classrooms, perhaps to go to larger spaces uh, for some physical activity, also outside uh, learning spaces uh, will be looked at. But for now, uh, we're, we're looking at a uh, lunch on a cart system where uh, lunches would be, would be delivered to our five, six, and our seven, eight would be able to report as they typically would. So similar to our <clears throat> safety protocols for students with allergies now, uh, individual plans will be developed through uh, the school nurse and through classroom teachers to address any allergy concerns for whether you're eating in the cafeteria or eating in the classroom. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, do you anticipate uh, recess still continuing at the 5-8 level? Uh, I think we need to um, first and foremost keep kids uh, safe and make sure that we maintain social distancing. But within that, we also know our students need to be active um, and they need that time to release energy. Um, so I, I do see us maintaining um, some time for students to, to have those opportunities. It may not be exactly like um, the routine we had before. Uh, it may not be a recess that ties in with lunch. It may be another time during the day. But Mike and I, uh, both we've been talking about this, we see the need for our students to, um, to break from the routine, if you will. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, this one, I'm going to turn over to Mr. Robilotti. Uh, <clears throat> evacuation drills, lockdown drills. Mr. Robilotti, can you talk a little bit about what that will look like in a socially distanced environment? Yeah, there's there's been no uh, lifting on the, the regulations for how many drills we need to um, provide our students with in the, in the upcoming school year. So we'll look at eight evacuation drills in the fall, four um, lockdown drills throughout the course of the year, typically in the winter months, and then four more evacuations in the spring. With that being said, uh, as the controllers of when these planned drills take place, we'll have to uh, really be purposeful and controlled with how we create, how we conduct these drills. There'll probably be a strong educational component where there's a lot of dialogue and conversation between the teacher and the students as to what it would look like or where you would go. Did you understand the words that were used? Did, do you know what that sound means and, and where you would go? And maybe we're not always evacuating the building uh, to its fullest capacity, but maybe we evacuate by certain wings or sections or, or grade level so that we can do uh, a full drill uh, and also take into account social distancing outside. Uh, but with that being said, oh, and also for the, the uh, lockdown drills, again, conversations, communications. Do you know what that language means? Where would you go? What would you do? Uh, were you in the, in the bathroom? Things of that nature. Or did you leave? Did you stay? Uh, really trying to make the students think about where they were and, and um, improve their, their reactions to those situations. Uh, but if we are in a situation where the alarm goes off and it wasn't planned, then we would evacuate as we normally would, uh, putting everyone's health and safety uh, as the priority and then socially distance afterwards. So if there's an unplanned evacuation, you evacuate. When it's planned, uh, we can be a little bit more controlled with that. Thank you very much. Uh, some of the uh, questions that had come up were related. Can we guarantee 100% uh, the health and safety of, of all children and staff members? There is no 100% guarantee for um, the COVID-19 virus. It's mitigation of the factors that attribute to the spread of the virus. So I just want to make sure people uh, are clear. Everything we're doing to put into play uh, into our safety protocols cannot 100% guarantee that uh, the virus would not uh, come into our building or spread, uh, but we are attempting to mitigate, to reduce the risk of transmission, to do the best we can to get back to normal. Um, again, we, we do recognize that there, there is still a risk in anything you do. Um, there's a risk when you go to the grocery store or go to the uh, gas station or to the market or uh, just walk outside your house, but we're looking to mitigate those risks, put the protocols in place for proper training, uh, to help our students understand the reasons for that, um, continue to appropriate hand washing and things like that. Um, there's a lot of stress going on. And, uh, you know, we feel stressed as adults. Sometimes we um, don't always recognize the stress that our students are under. So what are we doing to help address some of the uh, mental health concerns for our student and our staff members? So 
you just touched on um, the safety end of things. And, and for as long as uh, I've been a principal, one of the messages I give to the kids each year is, you know, my number one job is to maintain the safety and well-being of the building. And, and that um, will continue this school year with this added uh, wrinkle that we have never had to experience before. So when you think about that, you're thinking about not just the, uh, the physical health, but also the social emotional health. And I think uh, both Mr. Wetzel and I have been looking at ways to embed some of those social emotional supports that we have within the building uh, into opportunities uh, when the students are on site and when they're remote. So um, our structures are a little bit different between the buildings, but we both have um, some student services folks who are able to provide those social emotional supports. The uh, nuts and bolts of how that will look will really be determined by uh, the need that we see in the fall. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're gonna to need to take an assessment of what our needs really are. Um, I don't think it can be overstated that, uh, you know, we haven't seen some of our students since March. And I think uh, one of the most important things we're going to need to do once we have them safely on site is to just assess where they are social emotionally. Um, and I think once we've done that, we'll be able to find opportunities to embed our folks uh, into the pods um, to do some uh, whole group type things. There's also opportunities for those students to, to access our mental health professionals uh, on any given day. I don't know if there's things you'd want to add. Uh, I agree with everything Mr. Marone said. In my conversation with teachers this morning, one of the things I stressed is that we can't over plan between now and September. The more confident we are as adults, um, we can provide uh, we can provide our students with support. Uh, so right now what we're doing as professionals, as teachers, as educators, is making sure that we understand each scenario and understanding what it is that we need to do to bring students back safely, comfortably, and provide them with what they need. Thank you very much. Any uh, last comments? Any topics that you wanted to touch base on today? No, I think we're good. I think we covered it. Okay. I think uh, ultimately we're looking forward to having our students back. That's what makes South County a great place. It makes our school buildings alive is when students and staff are in the buildings. Uh, it certainly was disheartening this springtime when we uh, had to shut down for the length of time we did. Uh, we do recognize the, the need to uh, educate our students, want to do that in a safe manner, but we do uh, look forward to having everyone back. And that's uh, one of the things that will hopefully – uh, get back to a sense of normalcy. Um, we will continue to message out on our website. Again, this is a, a draft plan. Uh, between now and September, we will continue to message out to our families as to what that looks like to try to provide as much uh, information so you can make an informed uh, decision as a parent as to what uh, the fall educational program will look like for your child. Uh, thank you for watching today. We appreciate your time and uh, wish you all uh, good health and good luck. Thank you.